All right. Well, today we're welcoming Pastor Mark Service. Well, not currently Pastor. I still, I'm still going to call you that though. Uh, welcoming, welcoming, welcoming him to the show. Uh, so yeah, if if you'd just like to start off telling us a little bit about you, you know a lot more about you than I do. So maybe just a little of your background and kind of what you're involved in now and as a Christian, and maybe we can just start there. Okay. Well, uh, I've pastored for 17 years, uh, various places, even overseas in Romania. Uh, and so back in uh, 1996, I was pastoring in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, and the Lord uh, spoke to me audibly. It's the only time I've ever heard his voice audibly. I heard it twice, and I was driving from Colorado Springs to Pueblo, and, and uh, you know, I had preached from the pulpit. We need to always support local missions, not worldwide missions, even though I was a graduate from Christ for the Nations. Uh, and so I'm hmm. driving, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I've called you to the world. Now start acting like it. And I'm like, did I just hear that with my outer ears? And then I was like, Lord? You know, kind of like what uh, Samuel did. And I said, Lord, he said, I've called you to the world. Now start acting like it. And so I'm like, that was the Lord. And he spoke to me audibly, you know, even though auto, you know, hearing his voice out here, I think it's more important to hear his voice on the inside where your spirit is. I think that's a greater revelation, but I, I did hear his voice out here. Uh, and I remember when I got home, I walked in the door, you know, and back then, you know, if you had a cell phone, it was like the size of a big brick. So I didn't even have a cell phone, so it was a landline. Uh, and uh, and as soon as I walked in the door, I hadn't even told my wife, and the phone's ringing. And uh, I I went and answered the phone. It was a friend of mine, and he said, "Mark, your your name came up in my spirit today, and I, I'm on a I'm on the way to to go to on a mission trip. I'm planning a mission trip to go to Romania. And would you like to go?" And I said, man, you, you don't know what just happened to me. The Lord spoke to me audibly twice and told me he's called me to the world. And, and I guess Romania is the first place. And, and so I said, yes, I'll go. And that was the first country I went to in 1996. We've lived there uh, uh, two different times. And since that time, the Lord spoke to me. I've been to 48 countries. I got to go to a new country just uh, uh, last month. It was Moldova and as we went into man. Ukraine. And so now I've got 48 countries that I've been to, and I just believe the Lord's going to open up more countries. So that's kind of where I come from. I'm, I mean, I was Caleb's pastor years ago in Tonkawa, and uh, Caleb is an awesome. I left that minor detail out. Powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, a better guy than me replaced, I was replaced by a better guy, Derek Marshall. And now there's even a better guy. And that would be uh, uh, Caleb's <laughs> brother. So God is so good. Oh, what am I yeah, doing now? So... Yeah, what am I doing now? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, we still have a, uh... Yeah, we're living in Texas. Um, we still have a, a heart for the world. Uh, and so I go on different mission trips as, as the Lord provides. And we just got back from Ukraine. The Lord led us to go to Ukraine. One of the most powerful trips I've ever been on. In fact... Mm -hmm. The day we were there, we had uh, 32 missiles go off uh, because they're starting to the fight again. And there was a mass exodus out of the country. Uh, and people, like even the pastor said, well, why are you coming now? Everybody's leaving. And uh, of course, I said, like like David, we hasten to the battle. We run to the battle. <laughs> uh, even the road we came on got uh, hit by a missile. Uh, and they have curfew at 8 o'clock. You can't come out on the streets. You have to turn your lights out inside. The, the city's like, uh, you know, totally like a ghost town. It's pitch black at night so that they don't want uh, the Russians seeing them. But we had a powerful time, preached the gospel, and I really feel a calling. I just really believe that. that uh, they want me to come and start a Bible school there. So I, I feel like I'm going to be going more trips to the Ukraine. And it's such a, a great young group of believers. They love the Lord with all the heart. I mean, the pastor was so appreciative mm -hmm. of, Someone coming and encouraging him. I mean, that's basically what our ministry is, is a ministry of encouragement uh, and strengthening. You know, I do a lot of pastoral work with uh, various pastors. 
and we just encouraged him. And man, the guy was kissing me on the head the whole trip, you know, like, man, I love this guy. I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm saying, That's uh, awesome. so he's like, you're supposed to be here. I said, well, you know, uh, I just believe the Lord's going to open some um, financial doors so we can do that even more. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it was quite an experience. It, it really was. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, that's uh, one of the things I did want to ask you about. Uh, was there anything that happened on the trip? Like, did you see any any type of healings or any type of like deliverances or anything like that? No uh, pressure to saw, have, have something, but. <laughs> yeah, we we didn't necessarily, on this trip, we were more there to strengthen leaders. I mean, we pray for the sick all the time. We were able to feed a lot of uh Ukrainians that um, their war place, uh, some of them, you know, they've lost their houses. There's over 200,000 in the city that we were in. There's over 200,000 that don't have any place to live. Uh, so that's a miracle in itself to feed people. So, so we fed um, a lot of them and it, it was just a blessing to see that. And, and they were so sincere and so loving and so thankful, appreciative. Uh, probably one of the highlights of my trip just touched my heart so much. Uh, a lot of the people that we dealt with were not really even sick. Uh, I didn't see a lot of sickness. I mean, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. those issues seem to go away when you're fearing for your life. You know, that doesn't really matter yeah. as much as being encouraged. Uh, but we ministered a lot of leaders this trip. Um, uh, I preached a lot on authority. I believe that's one of the messages that's going to happen in the end times is the authority of the believer. There's a there's a great missionary. Uh, I think his name is McMillan that said that before Jesus comes back, that'll be the message that's preached because the devil, you know, we have to have the realization that devil's under our feet to do what we need to do in the last days. Mm. Uh, so I did a lot of ministering there about authority. Um, a lot of prophetic words went forth. Just, just, it was just the Lord encouraging. So that's kind of the, the vein that we were in. You know, I believe in miracles. I believe in healing. In fact, we're going to Pueblo, Colorado mm -hmm. at the end of this month, and we're going to have um, my pastor who used to work for A.A. A. Allen. If you've ever heard of A.A. A. Allen, the great revivalist uh, in the 60s, I mean, he had miracles all the time. He, he would um, he had a place called Miracle Valley that's in Arizona, and people would fly in with all kinds of, uh, you know, deadly diseases and get healed just getting on the property. I mean, it's like a porthole of glory <laughs> that would happen in that place. Wow. Uh, and and so my pastor studied under him. And and so this meeting that's going to happen in Pueblo, Colorado, my pastor's already been getting people's faces and what what their, their disease is. And he just, he keeps seeing a lot of people healed. So this will be one of those meetings wow. that that's, that'll be our focus. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. It's uh, the 24th through the 26th. Uh, uh, at a church in Pueblo. Wow. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, have you, uh, have you interacted with a lot of people or like even Christians, like who are like skeptical of, you know, healing and mm -hmm. deliverance, modern day thing, you know, demon mm -hmm. encounters, things like that. Right. Uh, how would you like, cause obviously you've seen a lot of that happen. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, so I'm just curious, like, what is your response like when you when you kind of come across that? Well, the, th the thing about it is a lot of things in this country is covered. You don't see uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they're behind closed doors. Like if you go overseas, we, we ministered a lot of, uh, you know, people that have demonic um, either oppression or possession. Uh, you see it. It's, it's more clearer over there. You can see the. The difference, you know, between somebody that that is possessed and not possessed, uh, and the way they respond. I, I remember in Romania one time, the you know, a guy started manifesting in the service and started beating his hand on the ground and crawling like a snake. And, and so, if you've never been in those kind of meetings, you may be skeptical. You may say, "Well, I don't really believe that happens." But mm -hmm. if you've ever been in one, I mean, I've seen some of those craziest things. Uh, one time I cast the devil out of a, a man who talked like a man, looked like a man. And uh, once the devil came out, this man became a woman. 
and that devil had suppressed. Weird. It's weird. It's suppressed so much on this person that uh, was holding back their true identity. Uh, and so I was surprised. I'm like, dear Jesus, this is, you know, the devil, you know, yeah. that can happen. I prayed for a, you know, minister to a guy in Indonesia who had literally had scales like a snake on his body and it wasn't made up. I mean, it was, it was really freaky and we didn't see him delivered, but you could just know the devil's real. I mean, he, he's real. Uh, I remember one yeah. time I was preaching in Romania and this lady who doesn't speak English, uh, she started manifesting in the service and, and saying some things in a man's voice in perfect English. And so when this happened, I, you know, one of the first things we do is, you know, sometimes the devil wants attention. So we'll, we'll take them out, out to another room so they don't disturb the service, you know, if we possibly mm-hmm. can. And so they, they, you know, nicely, kindly escorted her out and, you know, she was talking all the way out. And then I turned the service over to the praise and worship leader and I went out because I wanted to minister to her. And when I started to minister to her, she just was talking to me in English like, I I know who you are, you know, perfect <laughs> English in a man's voice. And uh, I know who you are and you can't get, you know, you can't cause me to come out of her. And he was, I mean, he's kind of carrying on a conversation with me. I just finally said, just be quiet right now in the name of Jesus. And I cast you out uh, in Jesus' name. I just took authority. And a lot of times I'll know when they come free because if you if you look in their eyes, the eyes are the window of the soul. So if you look in their eyes, they'll usually be cloudy. It's like you can't even see their pupils. And it's like their their mm-hmm. eyes are in the back of their head. And I'll say, you're free. And, of course, the devil wants to argue. say, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. So use use you know things of faith. You're free. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. And you just keep you know using those faith commands. And finally, you'll see the eyes come back, and they'll go, <gasps> and they be totally free. We've seen that happen so many times. But you know, in America, you don't necessarily mm-hmm. see that. Now you see the effects of possession. You know, the violence and, mm-hmm. um, but. You know, a lot, of, a lot of those don't come to the churches where you can minister to them. And it's not that you go out looking for a devil. I don't believe in doing that uh, because you could make somebody worse off by casting a devil out of them. And then they become seven times, you know, mm. they don't want to be free. You have to want to be free to be free. And, and a lot of times people that, that react in, in a service, they're just crying out for help. And they know that devil's got them mm. and, and they just want to find somebody that 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 knows how to, to, to administer. Um, deliverance to somebody that's bound so it's real yeah. i mean it, it's real possession's real mm-hmm. deliverance is real uh it says in mark chapter 16 these signs shall follow them to believe in my name shall they cast out devils you know mm-hmm. so one of the signs of a believer is casting out devils and you can ask most believers have you ever cast out devil no <laughs> you know i, I never <laughs> have done that you yeah. know, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Have you ever laid yeah. hands on anybody sick? You know, when you've seen people healed and healed and healed, and I've been healed of so many things, you know, I've had my nose crushed in and my inside my face and God healed, you know, they were going to do, they were going to have to do, yeah, I hit a, had a big old chain hit me in the face that almost killed me. It was a bad yeah. situation, but they were going to have to do plastic surgery. It's going to cost me, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to fix it. and I remember I was scheduled for the next day, and I just prayed to the Lord. I don't want to spend this money. I, I'm a missionary. We got to do, you know, we got to use this money for for the gospel. I don't want to spend this money for this. And then all of a sudden, you know, wake up and totally healed. And I've seen miracles wow. time and time again. I saw a miracle in Chattanooga when I pastored there. That, and there, we can verify these miracles. Um, even the there's a man in Oklahoma that was there. Uh, his name is uh, Mark Lamar from from Crescent. He's, you know, he was there and, and saw this miracle about this lady who had had a wreck and her car was flipped upside down and she was drugged on the pavement and her face looked like hamburger meat and she had no feeling in her face. And they were going to go in and grab <laughs> skin off of her, her backside just to put on her face. But it was like she was halfway paralyzed just from the impact of this, this, this terrible accident. And she gets healed. You know, she gets healed and she has brand new faith. She wasn't even a believer. Well, the next thing she wants to do is get saved. 
You know, she realizes God is real. God is real. So when you see those things, <laughs> do it. it's, yeah, it's hard to discredit or say, well, miracles are not for today. And I, I even have relatives that yeah. you know, they don't like me or they, they preach against me because, you know, they, you know, they don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I believe the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. I mean, you know, why would God even put that in his word if it if it's not? For something that we can operate in, you know, and I believe it's true that we, we should, we should operate in that. Mm -hmm. So did you grow up, um, first of all, did you grow up in a Christian home for those that don't know? And, mm -hmm. and was there any type of like, were you exposed to this type of teaching or, yeah. or this yeah. world, this side of things? Right. I, I grew up in a, uh, you know, church. I, I mean, I remember church of, when I was, I got saved when I was five years old. So it was a, a Pentecostal mm -hmm. home. So I kind of been Pentecostal. I've been in, introduced to gifts. Mm -hmm. Gifts have never been foreign to my thinking. Healing has never been foreign to my thinking, even though the church that I was in kind of preached that it's, you know, if it's God's will, you get healed. If it's God, if it's not his will, you won't, which kind of, you know, gave us excuses why people weren't healed. Um, you know that you know maybe god's trying to teach you something with his sickness so some of their theology was a little strange and and later i learned you know mm -hmm. you know it if god wanted to teach us with sickness then why do we try to get better why don't we just learn our lesson you know if we're really supposed mm -hmm. to be learning a lesson why do you go to the doctor then why don't you just stay home and learn it you know and i don't think that you know god has to use anything to teach us i mean he, he can teach us with his word he can teach us with his his leadership and, and jesus is a perfect image of the father and he went around doing good healing all that were oppressed to the devil so healing is, is something good it's not something bad so i was raised in this church uh so so the gifts of the spirit pentecost you know it's interesting uh caleb that uh they were telling me over in ukraine that the Russians came in and captured a little town. In fact, it's a town I've been to before, like seven years ago, I went to that town and preached. So they captured this town and they took all the preachers out and they shot all the preachers except the Pentecostals and they let them go. So they shot the Baptists first. <laughs> and they, so, so, you know, the one pastor said, you know, hey, it's great to be a Pentecostal. It's a great time to say I'm Pentecostal. So yeah. I'm not ashamed to be a Pentecostal, especially if I'm in Ukraine. I'll, wow. I'll definitely, and I don't know why that happened or, or what was the reason, but, it, you know, it was mm -hmm. like, I'm glad I'm not a Baptist today. Uh, so, but a lot of these denominations. <laughs> that is very strange. Yeah, it is strange. But a lot of these denominations, if you go back to the, where these, they all started in, in healing and miracles. You know, people think that the Methodists have been, the Methodists all, you know, but if you look at their history, they they used to call them the Pugup and Methodists. They used to have healing signs and wonders and uh, powerful things happen in, in their midst. Uh, you take uh, the Baptists, you know, some of them can trace their roots to the Dutch. They were Anabaptists, and these Anabaptists, uh, they had supernatural manifestations of the Spirit of God. I mean, speaking in tongues, things that, you know, would just freak people out today. That's where their roots come from. Um, you know, even some of some of the denominations we have today, they're 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 are supposed to be Pentecostal, but they're more Baptist now. Their roots come from you know a revival and and uh, things that happened in the Cane Ridge revival, which is a, a powerful revival that happened. Um, I believe it was in Tennessee or Kentucky, but it was a powerful revival that you know thousands of people came out and got ministered to, and it was it was like a, the rushing of a mighty wind. And there was a shaking happening, and it, it wasn't something that they were uh, manufacturing. It was something that, that really God was in their midst. So, I mean, you know, if God's there, I, I like what one preacher says. If God manifests, the only thing you cannot do is nothing. <laughs> you know, because hmm. God's there. Yeah. You know, fire's on your head. <laughs> the only there, one yeah. thing you cannot do is nothing. <laughs> so, so a lot of times we look at these expressions of, and we call them weird or, oh, these are Pentecostals or whatever. But a lot of times it's just a, a response to what's happening on the inside, you know. Mm. It's a response. Yeah. I'm getting so stirred. I don't know how to even respond. My flesh doesn't even know what this is. You know, even at the day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. they said, 
this is that which was spoken. I'm like, what is this? This is that. This is, they even called it a that. This is that which was spoken through the prophet Joel. I'm going to pour my spirit in the last days. There's going to be signs and wonders and things happening. So if people are uncomfortable with what's happening or uncomfortable with healing and miracles, they better get comfortable because it's going to happen more. Oh, that's good. I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have a memory of, and you can, you can go wherever you want uh, with okay. this, but uh, no, no agenda here. Uh, okay. I have a memory of, so we were, we were in a prayer meeting back when you were pastoring it at Christian Life Church. Okay. And the kitchen, the kitchen doors, uh, drawers and stuff started opening and closing and there was like a bright light. Do you remember that? Okay. Uh, not off the top of my head. I don't know if you remember that. Okay. I know that. Because what I remember is you walking back there. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, I remember you walking back there and, uh. And it stopped, and then you just walked back all chill, and I was just like, okay, <laughs> and we just kept praying. I don't know. I just had to ask if you remembered that or not. Anyway, uh, not off the top yeah. of my head, but, you know, sometimes there's Speaking of, demonic things that try to manifest, but, um, you know, we have authority. I know my authority, no, and that's yeah. what's helped. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> hmm. So, But I have no, no fear yeah. of. The Lord's had me in some really dangerous places, and you know, I had a guy one time try to kill me. Mm-hmm. I've had a couple guys try to kill me, but but you know, one guy he was going to split my throat, and I got him saved and got him filled with the Holy Spirit on the streets of Dallas. And you know, I just thought, Lord, that guy was going <laughs> to kill. Me. In fact, he said I was going to kill you, and he said, "Let me just, I'm going to pull my knife out." And he had a knife, and he said, "I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to slit his throat." And he's like, "Oh man, I want to right now." And then I, he got saved. <laughs> So yeah. I think the the power of God always trumps evil. And uh, but we had some supernatural mm-hmm. natural manifestations in Tonkawa, especially with the young people. And I think you were involved in that. Uh, your yeah. sister, um, your brother, mm-hmm. um, some of that stuff. You know, you know, it's a sign and a wonder. You know, a, a lot of times you, you try to. And that's the thing with people. We try to rationalize everything with our brain. Okay, I don't, I don't believe mm-hmm. that. I, I can't receive that. But yet, the Bible talks about signs and wonders. You know, it bypasses your mind. And as long as you, as long as you stay scriptural with it, you know, don't get weird and start following the sign, but follow the mm-hmm. Bible. I think that's so important with anything you do that you follow the Bible. But there's, you know, there's so many, you know, times even in the Old Testament that the glory would hit a place and. They'd be prostate. They would uh, prostrate, not prostate, prostrate. I mean, they'd fall down and uh, begin to worship <laughs> the Lord. I mean, it might have held some other parts of their body, but they would fall down and, <laughs> yeah. and worship the Lord. So, well, better be careful with my words there. No, that, that's super encouraging stuff. And I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if we want to follow the Bible, we have to be open to manifestations of the spirit because that's i mean did it just it didn't just stop you know so i love i love to uh talk about those things but yeah yeah always trying to exalt christ in that and not not you know just have a show but (laughs) but uh yeah yeah another story do you remember you remember the gold dust right you gotta remember that one yeah i remember that 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 was interesting yeah you know sometimes i just for other people that haven't heard it yeah, sometimes I have an issue with that because I'm like, Lord, if you're pouring out gold dust, you know, why don't you just give me gold bars <laughs> from heaven? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you but said. But I guess it would kill it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, man. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, I, again, another wonder. Uh, as long as you don't, you know, worship that or seek signs. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. I think we've been guilty for seeking signs and, but the Bible says signs yeah. follow the believers. So signs should follow. There, be, there should be something happening supernatural in our lives all the time if we're really believers. Mm-hmm. Signs follow believers. Um, you know, and I, so I've seen some signs. I've seen some really powerful things. But I, I don't mm-hmm. go out looking for them. But when they come, and that's what was happening at, at, at um, Christian Life Church in Tonkwa. I mean, gold dust, uh, 
you know what I I knew it was real. The reason I knew it was real is because you know we bought all these uh, um, Xboxes and we had a foosball table and we had all these games for the youth. You know, we were trying to make it a cool place to come and hang out, and we turned our whole fellowship hall into you know a youth center basically. And Mm-hmm. And, and I went, I'd go over there and nobody would be doing any of that. They wouldn't be playing any games. They'd be in there praying. I mean, praying all, <laughs> at, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, at 2 yeah. o'clock in the morning. I mean, they just were praying and praying. My son was involved in that too. So he had a key to the church. Of course, you know, you guys had keys to the church. And I'm like, and I could trust everybody you had all. A key. You, I think everybody had a key, yeah. I could trust you all that, you know, you weren't doing anything, any funny business over there. You just, you know, it's what we call sucking the carpet. You guys are just on your face sucking the carpet, you know, <laughs> just seeking the Lord. And I mean, there was something happening. Even the Assembly of God pastor came to me and said, man, you've got all the youth in town. I got one. <laughs> and I was like, I can't help it. There's something happening at the church. Uh, and it was affecting mm-hmm. the high school. And, you know, and it, you know, it, it comes and it goes. It's not that it, you know, you can ever maintain that i mean it's so powerful you know it's just right it's a, it's a refreshing for that season to you know and i believe god inspires us to motivate us to action and you know without inspiration it, you can't be dedicated i mean there's just something about being inspired that produces or breeds dedication where you're ready to tackle any project or anything you just, you know, you're ready to go for God. You're all in to what he's doing. And, and so I think the Lord does mm-hmm. give us these these inspiration, you know, inspiring moments, these times of inspiration just to motivate us, uh, you know, because without motivation, yeah, it's it's hard to get out of bed. You know, <laughs> it's hard to um, to do mm-hmm. anything for God. Uh, so we, we need that. We need those yeah. bumps. But they're for a reason. They're not yeah. just so you can feel happy and feel Chicken good skin. about yourself. Yeah. They're for a reason. Uh, it's to, to, to go yeah. into all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so on that, is there a... So we've been doing, like, evangelism outings, and the past couple of years, it's kind of been a new thing for us to, like, go out and, you know, approach random strangers and and try to, you know share the gospel with them, pray with them, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, for, so for things like that, uh, and even just, you know, I don't know if you've done a lot of that or it's more been preaching or things like that, Mm -hmm. but would there Mm -hmm. be any advice for like, because we're talking about the spirit, uh, working like, cause it can seem like there's a lot of spiritual warfare, at least with my experience, like you feel ready to go, you feel fired up Mm -hmm. and then you go out and it's like all the air just gets sucked out of you. Mm-hmm. Like, is there any yeah. advice just in following the spirit, asking God to move, like acting on those things to just asking for God to do those things? Yeah. That's uh, really broad, but. <laughs> well, I think you can um, more or less, I think it helps in a corporate setting instead of the individual. Uh, you know, you're more powerful mm-hmm. with more. I think that that helps energize each one of you to you know, to, to not be uh, result based because, you know, you're it's like you're firing on all cylinders. But if you're just one cylinder out there, you know, one piston, it's hard to keep it going. You know, you have the other pistons going that keeps the engine going. You know, if you want to use that at, mm-hmm. uh, about an engine. Uh, and I think that as ministers, it's good to use unconventional methods to win the loss. So look for things out of the box, because especially in, in today, you know, the message never changes, but the methods do. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times the way we present the gospel, um, especially if we're preaching down on someone, can hinder them from receiving. Um, so we have to focus on, Lord, each person is different. And Lord, what is that hook or what does that catch for them? I I remember on the streets of, um, um, I was at Mardi Gras and ministering, and I was walking behind this couple. Well, there's three of them. There was a couple and, a, and another person, and they were they were saying, man, they were so disgusted with Christians 
giving them them tracks. And so they were making a plan and I could hear them. I was right behind them because it's packed. You know, you're in like sardine, a sardine can. And, uh, you know, I was asking the Lord, Lord, give me something I want to share with this, this group here, these three people. And I just started listening and they said, the next Christian that comes up, we're going to tell him this, you know, that we're atheists. And they had this big plan they were hatching. And I just tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, I'm the next Christian. <laughs> you know, I was like, whoa, you know. So, so I was able to just break that barrier. And, 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 and they said, well, we're just tired of people passing out tracks. I said, well, you know, the reason they're, we're out here is because we love you. And I'm not going to give you a track. You already you don't need a track, but I, I want to just tell you about, you know, what Jesus has done for me. And a lot of times sharing your personal testimony, how God sets you free. Uh, and then, you know, it, you have to realize that evangelism is, is part of the office of a preacher and a preacher proclaims. And a lot of times a preacher, mm-hmm. it's, it's different from a teacher because a teacher, you know, he explains. So he's getting a message. He's putting things together. And, and that's probably where you may have. Uh, as far as witnessing may have a challenge because you're more of a teacher, you're more of a planner, you know, so, so it may be more difficult for you to be more, more the evangelist because it's, it's hot off the press. It's God <clears throat> giving you that specific word for that specific individual. Um, and so that's a gifting that, that, um, you know, not everyone is a go soul winner, but there, there is a place for everyone. Uh, because after they, mm-hmm. you know, you get them, born again then you gotta you gotta mentor them my pastor just got my 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 friend was flying on a plane and there was a uh he's a hollywood karate star years ago he was in you know back in my my day he was in red dawn and he was in um um uh, oh wow walker texas ranger and stuff well my friend got him saved on the plane but my friend's more a minister for deliverance. Well, he, he cast out devils. He just, that's how he is. So then he got him to my pastor uh, yesterday. My pastor got him filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied over him. And now they're putting him to me to disciple him because that's I'm, I'm really good at mentoring uh, people and taking them yeah. from the things of God. So it's kind of like we all have our part. It's not that we excuse ourselves from evangelism. I don't believe that. But when you go, it's good mm-hmm. that if you could connect with someone that's an evangelist, that would help you probably be able to let them take the lead and then be able to share some things, you know, in between when everything goes quiet and then you're able to, you know, to throw yeah. Some, some, yeah. Some, some truth there. So I just think you have to know who you are and how you flow. Um, you know, like I have a really good evangelist friend. That's what he does. I mean, he's he's the best evangelist I ever I ever met. And um, so what we would do is he would dress up as Santa Claus during Christmas because there's a lot of people that are are hurting during Christmas time and they go to these bars and uh, they're just asking for help. So he would dress up as Santa Claus. I'd dress up, uh, you know, as an elf or something and carry a bag of, of tracks with candy canes in them and. And then we had a guy that was an Elvis impersonator from, from Vegas. You know, he spent like six years in Vegas. His, his name's Ron. And, and he got saved. And so now, you know, he's a he's an Elvis impersonator. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if he does it right now, but I've, we've had him in our church. And he, we've had concerts and, and won a lot of people of the Lord just doing that. I mean, unconventional methods to win the loss. Yeah. So anyway, we go to these bars. I mean, we don't, you know, we're not bar hoppers. or We're just out there preaching the gospel. That's what we want to do. And they would mm-hmm. they would open the door, invite us in. They would have you know, Ron, get up there and sing. I mean, we had open doors just by using our head a little bit, just by using some uh, of godly wisdom uh, in our spirits to say, God, give us a way to reach the lost. And it was so much fun. We loved to do it so much, uh, and we'd get people saved all the time. I met more preachers in bars that were backslidden away from God and. They're like, man, I didn't think God could find me here. I said, well, he found you. You know, it's time to get right. You know, <laughs> go outside and play with them and get them saved and, or saved or recommitted or whatever it is that happens in that process. I mean, they're probably yeah, already yeah. saved. They're just, you know, get the mm-hmm. break the devil off of them. And uh, so we've, 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 but see, 
with Tim, his name's Tim, he's the evangelist. I mean, he's powerful. So with, when I connect with him, I'm able to win more people to the Lord because I can almost like mm-hmm. kind of share a little bit of his gifting. You know, it's like it just kind of rubs off on me, even though I'm probably not an evangelist per se, even though I have operated in that many times, but it's probably not my main gifting. My main gifting is a teacher. Mm-hmm. I can teach and I understand the Bible. I can explain things. I, I mean, we can go through scripture. You could you could pick a scripture and I could probably explain it because that's the anointing that's on my life. I mean, I don't know everything. I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that, right. you know, po- you know, some people call me the Bible answer man or something because I'm, you know, I know a lot of the Bible and, and that's just because of the studying mm-hmm. time that I've spent. I mean, I've, I've spent many, many hours reading and studying and meditating the word of God. So that's my gifting. But, but, mm-hmm. you know, Using unconventional ways, like we had an Elvis concert. We we had, of course, it makes people mad. Oh, we don't want Elvis in our church. You know, what are you doing? You're desecrating the house of God. I'm saying if people get saved, let's do whatever it takes to get people saved. I mean, I'll stand on my head <laughs> if it'll get somebody yeah. saved. And so then we had this Elvis concert. All these people that's never been in the church come. We had over 200 people. We had one in Pueblo and over 200 people when I pastored there. Over 200 people came in. And then he, he sang some songs, some Elvis songs. Then he gave his testimony. I got saved. Then he sang some Elvis songs that he had rewritten the words, like, since the devil left me, I found a new place to dwell. No, he he, re- hmm. he, he changed the words. And then he had an altar call. And then I looked around, and all these people are raising their hands, like, I want to get saved. <laughs> so it was worth that because of the wisdom of God. I believe the Lord will give you ideas, spiritual ideas, you know, to, to, you know, not come in so cut and dry, but, uh, you know, mm-hmm. just the wisdom of God, how to relate to people. You know, I, I remember one time on the streets of Waxahachie, Texas, uh, I used to go out and we'd, we'd just pass out tracks and stuff. And so there was all these, these cars and these biker, you know, biker dudes and, and car guys. And they were all in this, um, on this, um, like in this parking lot and they were doing something. And I was like, what are they doing? So I just kind of went up and looked and, you know, they had some old cars, they had some fancy bikes. I mean, it's just a cool place to hang out and show everybody what you, what you drive and, uh, and stuff. But, but they were trying to take these, these beer, they had these beer um, plastic uh, that holds a six pack and they were putting a bunch of them together and trying to break them. So they were having a contest who could break them. And, you know, it's hard. If you put three or four or five, I mean, you've got to be pretty strong to snap them. And I remember I'm like, Lord, this would be a good opportunity to witness. How do I do it? And the Lord said, well, just <laughs> tell them you're going to break them, you know. Hey, I can do this. So I jumped right in the middle of them and said, hey, get put all the ones you could find together because I'm going to break them all. And, I, and after I said that, I was like, what did I just say? Like, you're stupid, dude. What are you doing? You can't do that. You're not very strong. What are you doing? And it, and it came out of my mouth again. I was like, I, you know, I shocked myself. Like, I'm going to put all these together. I'm going to break them. And they go, okay, let's see. You, there's no way you can do this. I mean, and so they had, I mean, it was a bunch of them. I, I don't know how many for sure, maybe 30. I mean, it's like crazy. And I just took them and just like butter, I went, pop. And I'm like, dear Lord, I just broke them all. Well, now I have a, a, a captivated audience, and I start sharing the gospel with them, ministering to them. It was a powerful time. And I remember I got back. I was going to, to school, Bible school, and I got back to the Bible school, and I had a guy with me, so he verified everything. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe what he did. Mm-hmm. I said, let's get some other – let's get them together now. They didn't have beer, beer ones, but they had pop ones. Let's go find some pop ones. I want to do it again. You know, I couldn't even do like four. <laughs> So it was a supernatural thing that God gave me the wisdom wow. at that very moment. So you look for unconventional ways. You look for uh, God-inspired mm-hmm. ideas to, to minister to people on the streets. And, and it makes it fun. I mean, it's like I couldn't wait to go to a, go out on outreach because of things that we were seeing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it makes it fun. It was like, wow, this is going to be great tonight. Uh, anyway. Man, you talked about the no, environment. That's, that's really encouraging stuff, for sure. Yeah. 
you talked about the environment. One of the things that I do is I don't let any environment affect me because if you let the environment affect you, then you won't be able to minister in that environment. And people think they have to have the perfect environment to witness, the perfect environment to uh, get somebody healed. But you can't, you know, when you're ministering people, you can't say, uh, let me put on a praise tape right now. And when we get to song six, I can probably pray for you. You can't say that. You know, there's <laughs> there's no way. Right. You know, you have to realize this. People can get saved in any environment. People can get healed in any environment. Just because I'm not feeling it doesn't mean that people can't get saved or they can't get healed. I'm yeah. not waiting for me feeling something. I, I just have to step out in faith. And uh, I know God's there. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a it's a con- uh, an awareness. Um, it's having a, a daily awareness that he's here. He's in you. His presence is there. You're anointed. Whether you feel anointed or not, the Bible says you are. So you have to take God in his word. The Bible says I'm anointed. That I am anointed. Mm-hmm. So I just encourage you in that. And I know, you know, sometimes you don't feel yeah. that. Oh, man, I just really I feel like winning some souls today. Uh, it's just looking for the opportunities. You know, I was driving one time and I saw a guy sitting on the sitting on the curb and I, I stopped. I, you know, I turned around and went back and I got out of the car and I went up to him and I said, is everything all right? He says, no, I'm just having a hard time. And I said, well, the Lord loves you. He says, no, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. And, you know, he was kept going on and on. And I finally just said, are you mad? Did something happen in your life? And, yeah, God, God's never answered my prayers. You know, he's just going on. I was like, you know, this was before that movie came out. I had that line before the movie, you know, God's not dead, (laughs) that he talks about Mm. atheism. So I said, uh, how can you be mad at someone that doesn't exist? (laughs) You know, he was mad at God. You know, how can you be (laughs) mad at him? How can you be mad at somebody that doesn't exist? He goes, yeah, you're you're right. He got saved right there. So it's just those moments, looking for those moments. You know, I, I be I believe in spirit led evangelism. I think it works better than just getting mm-hmm. a bunch of people together. Unless you're doing some kind of a an unconventional thing that that um mm-hmm. you know, I look for that person in the in the darkness. Uh, you know, I look for that guy that's standing over there away from the crowd. You know, those are the people that you can really minister to and you know, I've done that. I've seen them mm-hmm. saved, I've seen them fill the Holy Ghost. Anyway. Yeah. Amen. No, that that's awesome. <laughs> um, that makes me excited to go back out. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Yep. Yeah. Um, another thing, uh, you mentioned giftings. Okay. A lot of people have a tough time just, I guess, being certain about what their gifting is. I mean, I, I have mm-hmm. a tough time with that. Like, okay, you can see some things. Like, okay, I've I've done this a little bit. I've done this a little bit. But you're like. How do you how do you view that? Is it do you think it's one thing? Do you think it's just different times, different things? I mean, I, I don't know how you go about looking at that, but or just how to okay. find that gift, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, the Bible no. says in Ephesians chapter one that it gives God good pleasure to know His will for your life, and, and not only His will, but what mm-hmm. you're called to do. I mean, the will of God. But I believe that. Finding the will of God is a little more difficult than we think. And the reason it's more difficult is that if you don't find it with it, if you find it on your own, you'll go out and do it immediately. But if you, if, if it takes the process of spending time with him, then you'll do it together. So I think the Lord makes it a little difficult just for the fact that you have to have him to fulfill it. You can't do the will of, of yeah. God without God, you know? If I'm yeah. going to do the will of God, I got to have God with me to do His will because He knows what <laughs> it is. Uh, and so that's where I think it takes time. There's a there's a season. Like I was called to to be a pastor mm-hmm. at five, but I didn't pastor at five. So with the com- calling is not the commission. Uh, so sometimes we get those two mixed up, and we think, okay, I'm called to do this. I better go do it. No, you, you could be called to it, but mm-hmm. you're not commissioned to it. You have to develop, it, yeah. You know, and I think it's better to 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 be developed than declared. You know, where people declare you and oh, that's a pastor. That's you're a pastor. You're a missionary. Well, you know, they're declaring you. I think it's better just to develop and 
And, and whatever you're doing, you'll be doing the right thing. And whether they call you a missionary or not, that's what mm -hmm. you're doing. Whether they call you a pastor or not, yeah. you know, you're pastoring. Uh, and so not so stuck on the title, but more the mm -hmm. function uh, of I'm just in the will of God. I'm just doing what God tells me to do. I'm, I'm following the Father. And so the will of God, you know, the, the callings of God, I, I think at times you operate in different callings. You know, there's a calling the Lord spoke over me years ago that I'm really not operating in yet, but that's going to come. I'm not I'm not concerned about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I operate as a pastor. That was probably my primary calling for a long time until the Lord spoke to me audibly. And then I became a, what you call an apostle or missionary. It's kind of the same thing. Um, and, and he, you know, I'm even though I'm that there's still something else the Lord wants me to operate in, you know. You know, part of the the fivefold ministry, and and that's another thing. There's the fivefold ministry, but then there's also uh, work, marketplace ministry. People are called to the marketplace. People are called to, you know, when we say fivefold, if you look in, um, I think it's in Corinthians, First Corinthians twelve, it talks not only the fivefold, but it talks about a ministry of giving. You know, so it's really sixfold hmm. then, and uh, you know, a, a mercy ministry. You know, it just it it kind of increases it. You know, we recognize the Bible, but there's more that, you know, without the giving ministry, you you know, you can't go preach the gospel. I mean, I can go preach, but if I don't have yep. any money to go, if I have no go dough, I can't go. Uh, right. So you need right. others to be involved in that calling. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, so at times you go through different things. I mean, you know, you the Lord will have you in something and then you, it's in a process to move you to something else. Um, and sometimes, you know, yeah. as a pastor, you may experience the evangel evangelist, you may experience the um, the teacher. Now you're a pastor. And one of the reasons the Lord did that is because now you have a better understanding of your congregation. You understand how the evangelist mm -hmm. thinks. You understand how the, the teacher thinks. And now you're a pastor. And you understand how, how pastoral you have to put all those together. Because if if you're pastoring a group of people that understand their calling, then you're going to usually have problems because the evangelist says, hey, we're not winning enough people of the Lord. What's wrong with us? The teacher says, hey, we're not discipling enough people. What's wrong with us? You know, so the prophet says, we're yeah. not putting things in order. What's wrong with us? The apostle says, hey, we're not going to the mm -hmm. world. What's wrong with this church? Why are we going to the world? And, and you're the yeah. pastor. Like, okay, okay. Yes, I understand that. But here's truth and tension. We have this too. I understand mm -hmm. that. But we have this too, you know. We have to feed our local people. We just can't go everywhere around the world. We have to focus here too. Yeah. You know. Okay, we need to focus on the world because the Lord said that. You know, like the like the saying, or it's the scripture. But you know, you hear this from the evangelist or, or from the the missionary. You know, the Bible says mm -hmm. to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We gotta go. If we're not going, we're wrong. We're in sin. We're either going or we're sitting. You know, but we got to be going. I mean, just, just yeah. hammering that. But here is what the Lord gave me one day. He said, son, as a pastor now, I'm in a pastor's mindset. Son, with the command to go is a command to stay because you can't make a disciple in just one day. So see how even though the go command there, there's also the stay command. And that's where a pastor puts all that together. So, so whatever you're called to do, you know, if you just spend time with the Lord, He'll help you do it, do it with him, and you're not going to miss anything. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to do it without him, and especially, you know, younger people, they feel like, you know, I have no purpose. Who, who am I? Well, your purpose is to spend time with the Lord. Your purpose is to, to grow in the things of God, you know, and if you'll do that, yeah. you'll be prepared to, to be able to, to do your calling, whatever that may be. So God says, I want to do it with you. So I may make it a little difficult for you to find, mm -hmm. but it's because there's a reason. I have to do it with you. I can't let you do it by yourself because you'll make a mess of it and you'll destroy. It. You know, if if you're not hmm. if you're not seasoned, you're going to destroy people with the prophet's ministry. You know, if you're not seasoned, and you know you're going to, you know, if you're an apostle, you're going to, you know, it's like you're a bulldozer going into new ground, pa paving a new road. But if you're not seasoned, you're going to destroy people in that ministry. You're going to run over people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're going to hate you forever. 
Uh, so it's just about, it's, it's about the laws of progression. It's about getting to know Jesus to do it together. And then it's not about titles. It's just about functioning what you feel the Lord's called you to do. And if they put a title on it, that's fine. You know, you don't even have to call yourself yeah. that. I mean, people call me pastor all the time. Definitely. I mean, that's probably, people see me as a pastor. But I'm really not a pastor now. Mm -hmm. But that's okay, you know. It doesn't bother me if you yeah. call me a title. I don't call myself Pastor Mark. You know, I, I'm just yeah. doing what God, if, if it's pastoring, that's fine. I'm just wherever I, you know, wherever the Lord is, that's where I'm at. <laughs> and, and, and what, yeah. you know, I kind of have a, I have a saying, you know, my home is where my Bible is. So wherever mm -hmm. my Bible is, that's where my home is. That's who I am. Anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, do you, do you have any, I know I keep asking you, do you have any advice? I'm getting better at this interviewing thing. Okay. Oh, you're uh, doing an awesome job. So, <laughs> Great, great. Uh, any advice for people raising kids? You've got a couple kids. You've got a wife. Uh, okay. Just having a family and, and being faithful to the Lord in that and, and being led in that and, and things like that. Are you talking from a ministry standpoint or just an individual, somebody that, uh, like a church yeah, member? Yeah, individually, just, uh, yeah, I mean, how do you, how are you led by the Lord and just being a husband, being a father? Okay. Things like that. <laughs> well, Some I think of us the have word... one-year-olds and we're a little bit uh, losing our head. <laughs> yeah. I think the word has everything to do with child raising. I mean, I remember I was invited to preach a seminar when I was just married. I had only been married a couple of years. And this seminar was in Cleveland, Tennessee, at a, a well-known uh, Bible school. And they invited me to teach on children, you know, and on being a parent. And so the first thing I said is, I got up there, I was like, man, I'm not a parent. I don't have any children. But the Word of God tells you everything you need to know about being a parent. And so I just used the scriptures, and I did it for a whole mm -hmm. week. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, and it helped me later when I did have children to apply those things uh, in raising my own children. Uh, so the Word of God shows you everything you need yeah. to know about that. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I've been the greatest father. I think I got too caught up in ministry and pastoring. Uh, you know, I, I was really good pastoring other people, but I think I struggled as a as a ministering to my own children. And a lot of times, you know, they won't hear your voice anyway. They're, you know, it's, it's someone else that can really help them steer them in the right direction. And I think as a parent, you have to pray that even when they're little, let Lord send the right people across their path. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think you shape them with the word of God. Uh, you put a frame around them. I mean, they're a beautiful picture, but a picture is incomplete without a frame. And so you take the word of God and frame their lives. And even if, yeah. you know, they have, my kids did really good until, until, um, uh, they went to college and, you know, college will take everything out of you. It, it'll put so much unbelief in you. Um, but then you have to believe I, I framed them with the word of God and they're not going to go astray and, and God's going to protect them. And the right people are going to come across their path and God's going to move mountains just for mm -hmm. them. And, and you just have to trust the Lord that, um, no matter what it looks like or what you go through, uh, my kids are, are, are going to go to heaven. My kids are going to know, you know, get on the right path. My kids are going to be, be powerful. And I have two boys, so powerful men of God, and I'm not going to settle for anything less. And, and so the Lord has helped me in that. And I believe that those words have shaped them and they're, they're, they're incredible, you know, men for the Lord. And, um, you know, they have a heart for God and they're sensitive. Both of my boys are so sensitive to the Lord. Um, you know, they're, they may be sometimes may me seem hard on the outside, but their hearts are just like sponges. And they just love the Lord with all their hearts. And so that's just encouraging. But that happened. Yeah. You know, it's not like, you know, you're born with all this knowledge and you can think, man, I'm going to be the best parent ever. And And I did things wrong. And the things I did wrong was overcompensating for how my dad treated me. I went the opposite, you know. I should have put a little more hmm. 
discipline in them. I, I should have not been so, you know. Um, I mean, I probably would have loved me as a parent because, you know, I was a little more lax to things. You know, I was, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you know, but my dad, and I told him I loved him all the time. I, I mean, they just like, okay, we don't want to hear it anymore. I mean, they got it kind of tired. I was just too sweet to them. I mean, I could have been a little rougher <laughs> and a little meaner and, uh, you know, maybe been a little more realistic. Uh, but you tend to project things yeah. that you've affected you and what you went through. You know, now you come from a, you know, your, your dad's awesome. Your mom's awesome. So you may mm-hmm. tend, and they've really trained you, you know, they've trained all, all you to, to be leaders. I mean, there's a lot of things they put in you. And, uh, so you may mm-hmm. have to go, you may overcompensate the other way and, or that way. And you just <laughs> have to, okay, Lord, I, I need to be even killing this, you know, cause we tend to take our experiences yeah. as, as as children and young people and, and, and put that into parenting and you can't do that. You know, and you gotta keep your yeah. word. I think that's the biggest thing with parenting is keep your word. What you say you do. I mean I, I was that way. If I ever said something I was gonna do it, if it was the last thing I did, uh and they could always trust my word. You know, and I kept my word. I mean my dog today, I have a dog that if I tell him something, he knows I'm gonna do it. You know? If I tell him I'm gonna get him a treat, he's <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm ready. You know, so I want to be that yeah. way with everybody, even no, my animals. Huge. I want to keep my word with my animals. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, that's a huge thing for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're we're getting toward the end here. Uh, okay. It's been great so far. Yeah. Uh, I kind of wanted to ask, is there, what future goals do you have or, or future plans? Maybe it's not a lot. Maybe it is a lot. Uh just going forward, like what's next for you? Where, where are you at right now? Uh, okay. Just as far as work, life, ministry, things like that. Well, we have a mission organization. And then, uh, mission. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. You, I've been talking more. I, okay. I, I was just going to add, uh, and then just to leave us off with, uh, just, uh, something encouraging to, uh, just to kind of close out, uh, for for Christians just wanting to follow the Lord and, and be faithful. Okay. okay. That's kind of what we try to end on. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm working right now. I One of the words I received, especially over in um, the Ukraine, um, I don't know if you know Ronald. You know Ronald. <laughs> mm-hmm. the, Ronald from Holland he gave me a word. Yeah, brother. Yeah. Uh, one of the words was that I would help older ministers recover their de- destiny. A lot of them kind of feel, especially in America, you know, what we do is, especially a pastoral, we say, okay, after you turn a certain age, you can't be a pastor anymore. And so we kind of push these, these men and women of wisdom out, out instead of realizing that you know, they have, still have something to give. You know, it's interesting that the Bible does yeah. not say that he gave you know, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors under 35. You know, he gives no age qualifications. <laughs> but yet we, you know, it's almost impossible if you, you know, if you want to get a church and you're 60, I mean, there is just almost, I mean, it take a parting of the Red Sea for someone to pastor at 60. Just the way our society now is, is pushed to older people out. And so that's one of the things that I feel really called mm. to to help the older ministers. Um, uh, and, and one of the words that was given that it would help recover, you know, recapture the destiny. And that's what I've been doing. I, my pastor, who is really unknown in man of God, is, is so powerful. Uh, you know, he kind of felt like he was in a basement. Nobody wanted him. Nobody was using him. Uh, he, he um, I mean, the guy traveled with a, the well-known uh, a faith healer, A.A. A. Allen. Hey, out of all people, if you, you know, do you research on him? I mean, God would see miracles all the time. And I, I talked a little bit about that. Um, so he knows those things. I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, um, you know, it's just like people have kind of pushed him aside. Well, now, you know, I'm taking him mm-hmm. everywhere I go. Uh, he's going with me. We're going to Colorado. We went to Oklahoma, had a power, some powerful meetings, really helped that church. So, I mean, they were like, man, this guy is anointed. You know, so it's not about your age, it's about your heart. 
You know, you, if yeah. you have a young heart, you can still pastor a church at 70. <laughs> but if you have an old heart, mm -hmm. then you probably shouldn't be pastoring any church. So it's not about your age. And God doesn't look at the age. He looks at yeah. the heart. But our society, we're so age-driven, and we're looking for that next person instead of seeing the wisdom that comes from all of us. You know, you can learn from young people. You can learn from old people as long as they have the right heart. So it's about the heart. So that's what, mm -hmm. really what I'm focusing on. Uh, plus, we're going to go back to Ukraine, do some – they wanted me to do a Bible school there, so we're in the process. We, we've had some yeah. – uh, some property given to us in Romania. So, you know, we'll probably base some things out of Romania. We may even move back. We're still praying about that. Uh, so now we have a church oh, wow. and a, yeah. a church and an apartment and a Bible school, all that in a big building. So it's like a blessing for the Lord. Man. Uh, so that's ours. Um, so we're praying about that. And looks like, you know, we'll be spending a lot of time in Romania coming up. Uh, so that's kind of what's on the burner. You know, we may we may be living yeah. in Texas, but that could change in a heartbeat, just following the Lord. And mm -hmm. and uh, so we just feel really called to helping older ministers for some reason. It's just, it's just so strong yeah. in me. Maybe because I'm getting older. I don't know. Maybe I know how I feel sometimes. No, but, yeah. Well, that's really awesome. I mean, we need we need older people more than more than ever. I mean. Yeah. People my age, we need, I mean, that's part of the reason for the podcast is I'm, I'm trying to learn from other Christians, you know, trying to mm -hmm. see how they came and, you know, ended up where they're at. And we just, we need older people with wisdom because we're, the younger generation is kind of losing their minds right now. So, <laughs> well, we need but, the younger generation yeah. with all the zeal and, and stuff. It's, it's like God is mm -hmm. just as, it's just as important the uh, Abraham's the Isaac as it is the Jacobs and the Lord always looks at uh, uh, generational yeah. alignment. Uh, he always spoke about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He never said Jacob. Uh, Mary's pregnant with Jesus, but Martha's pregnant with John the Baptist who represents the older generation, Martha. She's an older lady. Uh, so they're pregnant yeah. at the same time. So we see this, that God yeah, that's right back to the parts of the body. <laughs> God wants to use us all mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, so this country has a really has a, a a messed up respect for older people and older ministers. I see it all the time. But if you go to other countries like Asian countries, I mean, they really will receive from you. They'll honor you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they just have such a deep founded respect for preachers. Uh, like Indonesia, you know, they they don't respect the younger people, which I try to change that when I go that we need, you know, yeah. we need to, yeah. like I took my son, Justin, one time to Indonesia and it was Mark service and his team. We had, you know, a group of uh, people from uh, Malaysia with us at a translator and Justin was with us. And, you know, I had a three day conference and I was like getting tired and I was like, can my son preach? And the pastor says, no, we don't receive from younger people and i'm like what why what's wrong with younger <laughs> people sometimes i think they have more of a word for god because they're not they're not living off a of past or experience they have to have something fresh or they're not going <laughs> to yeah. make it you know if you don't get something fresh you're not going to have anything to say <laughs> you know sometimes you know you think about that they don't have years of sermons they can just preach you know pull one out of the hat oh i preached this hundred times let me preach it again uh mm -hmm. so he said, no, I, we don't want to have a younger preacher. I was like, I don't think that's right. You know, I, I'll, you know, we'll honor that, of course. But I said, he's anointed. He's a powerful young man. He's been all, all over the world. And he goes, okay, well, if he's your son, I guess we'll let him. And so he preached. There's probably 300 people there. He preached. And the pastor, he had an altar call. The pastor's running up crying and repenting of something. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole place was just like. You know, it's like God just set on all of us. And it was mm -hmm. funny because after that, he's like, you know, it was Pastor Mark and your team. Then it became a uh, Pastor Justin and your team, please come back. So I was just a team, mem <laughs> team member then. I was like, Pastor Justin and your team, come back. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. you really are honoring him now. And that's, that just blessed my heart. Uh, so I think it's two ways. And we have mm -hmm. to see that happen.
Um, I think it's it needs to happen in the states, and I think more preachers, yeah. especially younger preachers, need to honor that and not feel any competition or and not leave them in the basement. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got a powerful man of God in the basement or a powerful woman of God, and you never use yeah. them. I mean, you think, well, that's not our church, you know, that's not our church culture. Uh, we're hip, you know, but <laughs> it's overrated. I think, yeah, that's overrated. I'd rather have somebody with a, years of experience, you know, pray for me. I don't know, mm-hmm. not that I'm, not that I'm full of pride or anything, but they've been through it. You know, give me some counseling here. What did you do in this situation? Um, so yeah. we should always, we should always look for somebody older in our life and always look for somebody younger. I think, you know, if if yeah. if we're, they're older, we're going to ask questions. If they're younger, we're going to help them, give them advice. So either way, we're either asking questions or giving advice, and that helps on both sides. Everybody should be doing that, you know. Amen. And, and then you asked yeah. me to say, I was going to um, – you you asked me some theological stuff. I didn't know if you didn't want to talk about that tonight. <laughs> oh no, I mean we, we touched on it. Uh, yeah, no, I thought we I thought we went through it pretty good. So. Okay, <laughs> but yeah, yeah if you, you have any last words or anything? Theological traditions. Um, but I was just I was going to tell you, yeah, you know, share this. I think it's important. It's anything that's not based out of love and 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 doing the gospel or just traditions of man. So I believe in practical theology, mm-hmm. just like what we've been talking about, not religious theology. You know, you can, you know, get in your mind and have a swelled head, but we need an enlarged heart. And it's just doing the gospel, yeah. not having just a swelled head about the gospel. And and I believe the gospel <laughs> never changes. I mean, that's that should be a, a non-negotiable. Yeah. But, you know, message can change. We can change in our understanding of it, but it never changes. Uh, so, you know, anything yeah. that, that was established in the past, God's just saying yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, and so with that in mind, we have to realize that this is not something new about healing the sick. This is not something new about um, mm-hmm. speaking in tongues. It's It's been around. You know, it's something yeah. that Jesus talked about. It's something that the disciples, and it didn't pass away. You know, when theology doesn't pass away, if it's rooted out of God, it's it's forever. You know, it's kind of interesting that the, it talked about that there will be feasts in heaven that will be remembered forever, the Feast of Tabernacle. I think it is. It's going to be remembered forever. The feast. I think it's also a Feast of Passover. I mean, you know, they mm-hmm. never go away, even though we don't celebrate them here forever. You know, there's there's things that God has established that that are cornerstones, and, and I think healing, you know, that's something that that is in our DNA. It's something that we have to do, especially on Earth. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you won't need to be healed in heaven. And, and speaking with tongues, it says these signs follow them to believe. They speak in a new tongue. Are you a believer? Yeah. Well, then you should mm-hmm. speak in a new tongue. You know, so not trying to to explain away things just embrace what god says yeah you know and, and that's how we have to act and and, and one thing that I've, i'm seeing caleb and i'll just close with this i think it's really important because people think that the bible talks about god but really the bible is god i mean it's it's him it's it's his words it's 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 something that it says in Revelations, I think it's like 22, that if you add or subtract from this, you'll be guilty of some things. Uh, so so what hap- what's happening with our society is we're trying to say the Bible is not accurate or some parts of the Bible are not true. Uh, and we have to believe everything the Word of God says. I mean, people died to get this in our hands. And they say, well, what about translations? Yeah. Well, you know, Jesus preached from a translation. And called it the Word of God. I mean, that's interesting. He wasn't preaching from original manuscripts. As if he believed it. And he was preaching from a translation and called it the Word of God. I think the Lord's protected mm-hmm. those those translations through the years. Uh, and so, with me, you go down a, a dark hole or a, uh, you go off a, a slippery slope when you start saying, "Well, I don't mm-hmm. think that's accurate for us today." You know, even 
you know, the Bible even talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. It says it was an example for those that would follow. Even what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah was an mm. example for today. Um, and, and, and I know why people are doing this. A lot of preachers now, I'm seeing this, preachers are saying, well, that's not accurate for today, or that was mistranslated, or, you know, that's not really in the Bible. Some of it is, but that's not. Yeah. It's because then they can excuse things uh, just to fit the culture of today. And that's where yeah. it's a dangerous thing. So I believe that what I have in my hand is the Word of God got to me, and um, I believe the Lord's preserved that. Uh, mm. And, you know, I, I have to continue to see that as, as, you know, the Bible says men were inspired by the Holy Spirit and wrote these things. So these are Spirit-inspired words that were, even though it was given to a man, he mm -hmm. wrote it by the Holy Spirit. Just like Moses, you know, the Ten Commandments, first of all, God wrote it in stone supernaturally but then moses had to rewrite it because he broke the first commandment but that's still considered the word of god even though moses rewrote it yeah it's still considered the word of god okay i done preach myself happy no i love it i love it i, I just don't want to keep you for eight hours no, no I don't. so the word of god is the word well, of god well i appreciate you coming on yeah so that's a non-negotiable for me so we just you know we gotta yeah. honor that Come on, study it every day. Yeah, well, I'm going to stop recording, but I want to keep you on for a few seconds afterwards, so don't jump off just yet. Okay, sounds good. Well, that's Pastor Mark's service. I'm going to call you Pastor. Thanks okay. for coming on. Yeah, all right.